Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm so thrilled that you are choosing to invest some of your day learning with us. And as you come into today's webinar event, I hope that you'll take a moment to find the chat. We would love to be engaged with you throughout today's event in the chat. And so we would welcome you to tell us where you're calling in from today. I happen to have a new chat host today, Kira Williams. My colleague is here. She will be your host for the day, and we would love to know where you're calling in from. In the event that you are attending this webinar event as part of your professional development, we would also love to hear about what organization you're representing. So if you want to take a moment to let us know in the chat, not only where you are geographically, but also where you are professionally, we would love to hear about that. So I am going to say welcome in Boston, Massachusetts, and welcome in Seattle. We would love to hear from more of you. Uh, Catherine is here sending all the love from Charleston. Thank you, Catherine. And Juana uh, Bordas, our speaker today, is calling in from Denver, Colorado. Is that right? Yes, I am. I was Do just have, in the mountains this weekend. Do you have any sunshine today? We are having a beautiful Colorado. It's called springtime in the Rockies. And the reason they say that is because tomorrow it might be snowing. <laughs> but today it's like 56. It's beautiful. And so um, when you live in the Rockies, it teaches you to respect Mother Nature because you know that she's Amazing. Well, so welcome to Kyle from Minneapolis, who works for Barrett Kohler Publishers, the publisher of Juana Bordas's new book. Uh, welcome to Jacqueline in Cincinnati. Uh, Jacqueline works for a cooperative for education and nonprofit working in Guatemala. So hello in LA, Spartanburg, South Carolina, Central Illinois, Canada, Texas. Um, it looks like we have someone from Mass General uh, Brigham in Boston. Uh, we have someone speaking Spanish to us in Chicago, Bienvenidos, Fernando <laughs> from Chicago, uh, someone in international education in DC. Uh, looks like we have someone in Scotland. So thank you to those of you who are typing in the chat. It is great to see all of you. And one of the things I wanna let you know is that we will take your questions uh, later in the event, but we would love to have your engagement throughout the event. So make sure you use that drop down menu to type to everyone so everyone can see and engage with your comments. And then uh, later on in the hour, we will take some of your questions. Uh, but for now, I wanna take a moment to introduce Juana Bordas and her amazing new book that's coming out next week, The Power of Latino Leadership. And if you're checking out my bookcase, you'll see I have a whole shelf of these uh, beautiful books. Available uh, for purchase. <laughs> yes, available uh, available for pre-order now. So Juana is the president of Mestiza Leadership International, which is a company that focuses on leadership, diversity, and organizational change. Uh, Juana formerly was a faculty member for the Center for Creative Leadership, CCL, which you may have heard of, where she taught in the leadership development program, which is one of the most highly utilized executive programs in the world. Uh, Juana was also recognized by the National Diversity Council as one of 100 Latino influencers, influ influentials, I'm not sure. I want to make sure I get that right. <laughs> influentials in the United States. And this, uh, this new edition of the book is following... Uh, one from 10 years ago, originally the power of Latino leadership was released in 2013. There are a lot of updates and uh, new content in this new book. So we are so thrilled to be able to learn with you today, Juana. Yeah, well, I want to say that the new edition has the word ahora in it. And ahora, if you want to hold that up, means now. And what's really happened in the last 10 years is the incredible growth and development of the Latino community. And so the book documents what's happened with Latinos in the last 10 years and how this is Latino time in America today. <laughs> the time is now uh, the for time Latinos. Is now. Ahora. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, before we dive into our questions, I want to note that we do have closed captioning enabled. So if that would be of help to you, we want to make sure that everyone is, is included and you can go ahead and turn those captions on. We are also recording. So in the event, and I know that this is going to be a rich hour full of learning, in the event that you would like to share this with your colleagues and others who would like to learn about Latino leadership, we would welcome you um, and we'll get this link to you as a follow up and you can share it with your colleagues, friends, everyone who needs to learn that the time is now. So as we get started this morning, uh, Juana, the new book, you talk about three forthcoming seismic so social transformations, and one of them is about intergenerational change. Let's talk about that first. Tell us about that seismic transformation that's happening as it relates to our generations. Wow, yes. Well, you know, 
when I was a young girl, I was like 19, um, I, I saw President Kennedy. And you know, at his inauguration, he said, let the, time, let the word go forth from this time and place that the torch has been passed to a new generation of leaders. And that really inspired me. Um, and that was the baby boomers coming in. And that's what we saw in the last century. But 10,000 baby boomers retire every day. And so what we're seeing is that one generation is, um, is leaving in a sense, but we need them. That's what I wanna talk about intergenerational leadership. That's all of us working together. And at the same time, the millennials and Zs are the largest generation in history. And so uh, what I'm saying with this change is that it's time for us to really look at intergenerational leadership, much like we did in the 60s with the boomers beginning to take over. It's time for us to prepare a new generation of leaders. And we know that the first Gen Z just got elected to Congress, Maxwell Frost. And so you're seeing that this generation is ready to, to learn how to lead. They are, however, and we can talk more about that later, uh, dealing with incredible problems such as climate change and unaffordable housing and, and uh, college debt. So, but, but we are in this transition and I wanna encourage everyone to really think about how we can work together as different generations. The second one that's so important is that these millennials and Zs and the people younger than them, half of them identify as multicultural or mixed. And so what we're seeing in America today, and 35% of Latinos identify as mixed, we're seeing this transition into a multicultural society in which we won't have a dominant culture anymore. Uh, and won't that be beautiful that we'll all have all these different colors and the, at the, and the younger generation is embracing this. This is what they want in their future, their music, their, their, the things they read, the, their friends, they're all, they're all from different cultures. And then the third one, we've been in this process of becoming a global society, but that's even going to be a greater in the next century where we really will be a world community. And Latinos are also contributing to that because we come from 26 different countries and many of us stay connected to those countries that we come from. So we see this youth transition we see this transition in becoming a multicultural society and becoming a global society. So that's the future and that's what leaders have to be looking at. Well, let's take a moment to find out a little bit about our attendees today, Juana. We are very curious about what generations this audience represents. And so I put up the poll, which of these generations do you represent? Are you among the baby boomers? Are you part of Gen X? Are you a millennial? Or are you a member of Gen Z? And if you need, Juana, you are going to tell us what years people were yes. born. Yeah, well, the boomers uh, are the 46 to 64 that if you were born in that period, you're a boomer. Uh, Generation X is 1965 to 1979. So that would be Gen X. Millennials, which is a huge generation, it started in 1980 and goes to 2000 when we turn the century. And then Gen Z takes over from 201 to 2020. And so th that's okay, almost a baby boomer. I will put down that down too. But congratulations, born in 65. So, so we were see. curious, yeah, if there were any who were older than the boomers, any born before that uh, time period of the boomers. It looks like we don't have any Gen Zers on this call, um, which is interesting too. Um, so thanks for taking the time to answer the poll. I'll give you just a couple more seconds and then we can take a look at where our audience is. Uh, it looks like we have 44% of our attendees today who are part of that baby boomer generation. We have 37% who are part of, I, I guess I'm not sharing. Let me share. Yeah. Uh, oh, it went away. 30, <laughs> oh, let me do that. Oh, okay. All right. 37% are part of Gen X, which I'm in, in that camp, born in 1971. 19% of our callers today are millennials, and we do not have anyone representing Gen Z on the call. It looks like we have at least one person who was born before. Uh, baby boomers. So we do have four generations of people on this call. Thank you, Janet. Wow. Born, so born had, in 1942. Yeah, so this message can really be tailored for our boomers because it's really our responsibility to pass the torch of leadership to the next generations. And let's see if we can't encourage uh, Gen Z. This may not be their thing to learn about leadership and stuff, but we need to encourage them and let them know that these kind of things are important in their development. 
Well, welcome all the generations. The point is that in our workplace today, we really are dealing with four generations, and that's another diversity and inclusion uh, issue that is really important to address. Certainly so. So when we were talking about these three seismic social transformations, I want to make sure that everyone is tracking with us. The first one is this generational transformation where the boomers are handing off to the younger generations. Uh, the second one is the multicultural society that we are becoming. And the third one is the global community that we are all a part of. Do you want to uh, spend a little bit more time talking about either of those latter transformations? Well, I think the transformation to the multicultural age is a really important one because not only of our history in the United States, but because of the opportunity we have since we are a nation of immigrants and we have people from across the world here. But the most important thing to think about is that, you know, we've had all these discussions about diversity and inclusion, and yet young people are kind of over that. They're into what are the benefits of having this multicultural society, whether it's the food, the music, the thoughts, the leadership, which is very different because communities of color have had to have kind of an activist form of leadership in order to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. And so this multicultural transition, you know, I want people to see this as the next step in human evolution, as the next ability to grow, to learn, to, to uh, incorporate different patterns from different communities, cultures. And so I believe it's a really exciting time and that we have to move this diversity and inclusion conversation to start looking at the future and where we're going as a people and that we can all participate. That is powerful. So Juana, let's talk for a moment about the Latino phenomenon and what role the Latino community plays in this. Yeah, well, the first thing for folks is that um, we not only contributed 75% of the entries into the labor force uh, in the last decade, but that's gonna continue. 78% uh, of the new entries into the labor force are gonna be Latinos. And you all know that Latinos love to work, you know, whether it's a roof, putting a roof on your house, taking care of children, being the essential workers. Now we're moving into management and leadership, but Latinos love to work. We have the highest participation of any group in the labor market. And we like to work with what something we call ganas or gusto, you know, give it your best shot. It's part of our culture. <clears throat> and when you look at Latinos, Latinos are a fusion people, mainly the European, which are the Spanish, and the indigenous people of this hemisphere. So they're kind of a, a mix between the old world and the new, between uh, the indigenous and the European. And so you have that mixture, but I also have French blood. My father was French Nicaraguan. Uh, pretty sexy, huh? French Nicaraguan. <laughs> <laughs> and so Latinos have all these mixtures and, and we represent that, that the strength of, of um, fusion, the strength of putting things together. Mother nature loves a hybrid, you know? So we're very energetic. Second of all, we're very young. You know, when you look at 60% of us are under uh, millennials or younger. And so the wave of Latino change has really just started uh, happening because of our youthfulness and because of, uh, of the fact that as these young people grow in their leadership and power, they'll be able to bring their multicultural perspectives into society. But it's even better than that. Latinos started 80% of the small businesses in the last decade. So we have this entrepreneurial spirit, whether you're running a small business or whether you're in a company and bring that sense of can do and risk taking and how do we do things differently. So 80% of new businesses. So we're very entrepreneurial. And as I shared, we're also pretty international, you know, that we have, um, you know, ancestry from different countries. You know, the Spanish went everywhere. I mean, they were in Europe, you know, they were in Africa, they were in the Caribbean, they were in South America, they went all the way to Valdez, Alaska, in this hemisphere. And so uh, we really have that sense of being international and staying connected. That's really important because over 25% of our trade comes from Latin America and Mexico is our largest trade partner. So there's an economic, economic engine that Latinos are providing for the United States but it's really our culture that is our greatest gift. You know, uh, generosity, mi casa su casa, hard work, we talked about um, the idea of familia, but not just mother, father, children, but extended familia and community, that sense of connectedness, because Latinos are a we culture. Uh, mm -hmm. People come first. 
And so there's all these incredible things that are happening in the United States, whether you're looking at our music, which is also fusion, or whether you're looking at our food and people love margaritas, Taco Tuesdays, uh, Mexican <laughs> food is our favorite cuisine. I mean, the Latinization of America is going to be a really good time. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit before we got started live um, about uh, millennials and how they have taken on the food uh, of the Latino culture. Well, so let's talk a little bit more about the content in the book. So in the book, you outline 10 leadership principles that demonstrate the socially responsible, people-centered, and life-affirming ways with which Latinos lead their communities. And of course, we don't have time to talk about all 10, but I would love for us to talk about a few of the principles in greater detail. And what can people expect uh, to learn as they dive into the book? Yeah, well, you know, I think, uh, again, the Latino Latinos weren't even declared a group till 1980. I mean, that's pretty interesting. Before that, we had no identity. When I first filled out my census, I either had to put black or white, you know, so the, the whole phenomena of Latinos is kind of just beginning to, um, to uh, enrich the American palate. We didn't, and Latino was added in 1990. And so, um, so, so that's the first thing is that we need to look at, at the this is an emerging community and we're still working on our identity because we are so diverse. It's not just that 35% of us believe we're mixed, but you know, um, a third of us are Afro Latino. And so we, we have a mixture of all these races and we claim our indigenous roots, 25% still, still say we're indigenous. And so we have this mixture of cultures. Well, what happens when you have to lead that kind of diversity? You know, that's a lesson for America. How do you lead a diverse group? And second of all, how do you lead a marginalized group? Because Latinos were colonized. I always kid my South American friends. I say, you have to feel sorry for Latinos in the US because we were colonized twice, once by the Spanish and once by the Anglos. But that makes us bicultural, multicultural people. So we have gifts to give now. And uh, there's a saying in Spanish, no hay mal de que bien no venga. There's nothing that happened that something good won't come out of it. And that's what I see happening with the Latino phenomena that we're really at a point now, ahora, to be able to share our gifts. So this leadership grew out of um, having to step by step, you know, almost century by century, help a group of people that were marginalized to advance. And so our leaders had to inspire people when they couldn't pay them. Hmm. They had to inspire people when they knew, my parents knew they would never see it in their lifetime. They had to inspire leaders to know that they were working for the next generation and the next generation and to have that kind of hope and to have that kind of long-term commitment. So I'll, I'll briefly give you a couple of principles. One is the leader is equal. And that's a very important thing, you know, because we're coming out of hierarchy and we're coming out of dominance. And by the way, the younger generation really um, is pushing back against that. They wanna see more equity, they wanna see pluralism, they wanna see respect across the generations, et cetera. So, so we have to change dominance. We have to go to more of a lateral type leadership, more reciprocity, more sharing. And that's the leader is equal. That's me recognizing everybody I work with and everybody that contributes as essential, as adding value and showing the same respect for someone that keeps the place tidy so you can work as the IT person, as the people who do the finances so you can get paid, as the people who do marketing so you can grow the organization. We respect everybody and that's called the leader is equal. And when you do that, it encourages people to think they're leaders too. And that's important because when you're talking about critical mass leadership, which is what has brought communities of color to where they are today, you need all hands on deck, right? And if you do that, then you come to a second principle, which is called leadership by the many. That's how we're gonna transform America. It's leadership by the many. We need to get more civic engagement. We need to get people you know, to get some skin in the game and to say, this is our country. We're gonna make it the best, the best we can make it. Yes, we love our past and our history, but we are in a position right now to even make America uh, what it can be and should be. And so leadership as, e as equal, creates leadership by the many. And that's inclusion. You see, we talk about inclusion. Well, inclusion is 
recognizing the talents and values of each person. Inclusion is making the table rounder so that we have more leaders. And inclusion is everyone has a role to play as a leader. So those two principles kind of balance each other. Another one that I think people will be really interested in is called Si Se Puede, Yes We Can, which is a, a Latino saying which, um, you know, actually elected a president, yes we can, you know. <laughs> and that's that spirit of change and of contribution. The only way Latinos advanced for the past 100, 150, 200 years was this idea, yes, we can. And I want to emphasize we. Mm -hmm. Again, we. You know, it's a collective form of leadership. It's not hierarchy. It's not leadership by the few. It's leadership by the many. And then the whole idea that together, working together, we can create something better. Yes, we can. That idea of vision, that idea of change also. And so you have to be comfortable with people contributing and uh, actually transforming the, the organization. So those are three. And then I'm going to add one capper because I don't want to talk too long. And that's gozar la vida or leadership that celebrates life. One of the ways we kept moving forward step by step, you know, year by year, was that Latinos while we work hard, we spend more money on going out to eat, on celebrations. We invented the word fiesta. You know, we, we, we just love to celebrate with music and food. And so gozar la vida is that, that leadership should also be celebration. We should celebrate the, what we're doing together, the people that we work with, what we achieve, and then step by step or paso a paso, we keep moving forward. And so those are some of the principles I think that Latinos are contributing to America. Wow. Um, Juana, I'm just in awe of your passion and your energy and your inspiration. And so I want to recap those four leadership principles. Uh, the, the last one was leadership as celebration, uh, leadership as many. So we, uh, yes, we can, that spirit of can do, and then leader as equal. Uh, yeah. So really inviting others to the table. I'm curious in the chat, if you want to tell me which of those four resonates with you most, which of those four do you see uh, could add value in your organization? And uh, as you put that in there, I would love to see it. Yes, we can spirit is so powerful, isn't it? Um, leader as equal is one that's resonating. Uh, I can't read Spanish, Isabel. Gozar la vida. <laughs> Which one is that? Gozar la vida means to enjoy life. Ah, <laughs> uh, enjoy life. Okay. Well, you I've have seen... to realize when, when you have all of these things, you're a marginalized community. You've been discriminated against. There's been racism. We know that. We are going to transform that. And one of the ways we transform that is to celebrate together. You know, because that's something that that can inspire the human spirit. Amazing. I was going to say that we will talk about another principle, and that's intergenerational leadership. But I think we ought to keep that because that's something that we're going to talk about a little later. But we are an intergenerational community. Even at our events, you'll see the old ladies like me with the young kids and everybody together dancing, singing, and having a good time. Amazing. Well, I'm seeing a lot of people resonating with this leader as equal uh, principle. Um, and that's one that is always present for me that we're working together. You know, it's not that people work for me, it's that people work with me. Um, so let's talk so, so, about that. Um, Becky, let me just say something about that. Uh, sure. Particularly as, uh, because we have a lot of women online. You know, when you look at the, the, the transition in leadership, part of it really is about women's leadership as well. And we can see how long paradigm shifts take. Women have had to vote for over a hundred years now. And, uh, and women are bringing in a more relationship oriented leadership. So, and Latinos are resonate with that, of course, to, to be a people centered relationship oriented type leadership. But women know that it's hierarchy and dominance that prevents people from really you know, participating at the highest level. And so this transition that we're going through is really for everybody, not just for Latinos. It's for women, it's for people of color, it's for the young people. We want a more equitable and, and, and um, just and uh, fair society. And so the leader is equal really promotes that. Thank you for that, Juana. So, um, you know, we noted that the majority of people on this call are baby boomers and Gen X. And so I'm curious for those of us who are in the older of the two generations represented in the world today, how can we as leaders prepare that next generation for leadership? Well, you know, I was blessed to have I know you don't believe this, but I have a millennial baby. <laughs> She's in her 40s now. And I have to say that what I learned, um, you know, when I was growing up, 
Uh, if my parents said jump, you were like, how high, right? Well, we did not, the boomers did not question until we got to the 60s where they said question authorities and things changed. You know, we pretty much followed what our parents told us. Well, when I'm raising my millennial daughter, that didn't work at all. She wanted to know why. <laughs> why should we do this? How should we do this? What's the purpose of this? You know, millennials and, and, and people that are younger, they have been, they're the most highly educated uh, generation, first of all. And she's been on a computer since she was three. So millennials have a way of thinking that I go like this. That's very different than, than we think, you know, that they have a, a, they have a, they have a propensity for complexity that many other generations don't. So I'm making this point because in the past, it used to be one generation was leading and the other was following. Today, just like with the leader is equal, we have to have more lateral relationships with the younger generation. We have to respect them and ask them what they think and kind of, they want allies, right? Allies means you're together, step by step, um, even different than mentoring. They want people who are going to roll up their sleeves and work with them. So it's a very different form of leadership when you're talking about a boomer that was raised in a more traditional society to a society where young people today, young people today are global, right? They, they are highly educated. Uh, they've been on computers, so they understand complexity. Uh, and, um, and, and so they really want to participate at a different level. And that causes us problems sometimes. And we do have to say, wait a minute, we have experience and knowledge, and this is tried and true. Let's work with this and let's see how we can make it better. But it is showing more respect than I um, grew up with, if you want to call it that. Yeah, it seems like it might take a different kind of humility of being willing to learn from people in younger generations and invite their contributions and ideas. Yeah, well, um, you know, they're, they're training me. You know, if I don't know something, I go, well, let's look it up. <laughs> yes. They'll pull out their phones right away, right? Or, or the fact that, you know, the we know that we that have been in work for a long time that things take time and yet they've been socialized to be on computers where things happen very quickly and so part of our uh, teaching if you want to call it that is really giving them perspective uh, and helping them understand that you know it's one step at a time and that we move forward and then we integrate we learn and then we move forward and so we have a lot to teach them but at the same time uh, that you know that they can keep us young for one thing and on our toes for another. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so you've mentioned a few times, uh, one of this interest in our culture right now about diversity and inclusion. And so I'm curious about the ways that the 10 leadership principles in your book can help us to build a more inclusive and equitable society. And obviously leader as equal, you know, that's the very definition of an equitable society. So what else can we learn? Well, I think first of all, um, you know, for the people on the call that uh, that that um, are from the mainstream society or something, you have to realize that I'm Dr. Bordas and I have been studying mainstream leadership and I have been grown up in the mainstream society. I've been successful at universities that were crafted from a white perspective. And so as a bicultural person, I know a lot and can function in the mainstream culture. And so I think today there's an invitation and I want people to see it as growth, as an opportunity, as a chance to evolve, as the next step in, in human trans, uh, transformation. It's an opportunity today for us to become multicultural and to learn from each other. And yet um, only people of color have had to really learn the mainstream culture in order to be successful. And, and the Latin community today, I was the first in my family to go to college. So I opened that door. Now all three of my daughters have uh, advanced degrees. We are developing an intellectual class, but this is the first one. I mean, I opened the door. There was, there was no other Latinos at the University of Florida when I went there. And my um, senior, junior year, I marched to integrate the university to bring African-Americans onto the campus. So we have to look at change and see how far we've come since the 1960s when that happened. And what's the next step that we're gonna take to bring our society to the next level? And so I would encourage people, first of all, to learn and to look at that learning opportunity as a chance for growth, something positive that you want in your life that's gonna expand your abilities 
your capacities, your understanding, and connect you to humanity in, in a higher form, I guess. And so we need to, to, to change the conversation about diversity. Hmm. You know, some people are saying that they're fatigued, that, you know, they've already, no, it's not about that. It's that we are now ready as a, as a humanity, as a country, to step into a new level of who we are as people and to share the gifts and benefits and, and the cultural values of all the people that make up our great country. But we have to level the playing field. We have to make the table wider, you know, and it's an add-on process, by the way. You know, you know yes, you ha- might have to do some healing or you might have to deal with some of the things that, that prevent you from really engaging at the level you'd like to. But in reality, it's an opportunity. Yes. So let's talk about the opportunity to learn. And I know that you and I came into this call curious about people's past exposure to learning about the Latino experience. So we have another poll for you. We would love to know, have you invested time to learn about the Latino experience? You know, yes, like maybe you've read some fiction. Uh, Maybe you've read nonfiction like Juana's new book. Uh, Maybe you've learned another way or maybe you would like to learn more. And if you want to, you know, give us some more details about that in the chat, we would love to hear. Um, I'm going to leave that poll open for a moment so that we can get a sense of, you know, what investment have you been willing to make in learning about the Latino experience and all the richness that exposure to the culture can bring. Um, So thanks to those of you who are answering. I'm going to leave it open for another second and you can select more than one. Um, And just out of curiosity, while we're waiting for people to answer the poll, Juana, in addition to your book, The Power of Latino Leadership, are there some resources that you would recommend for people who want to learn? Well, you know, and and this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, If you're a bicultural or or multicultural person, you know, you may have friends in different communities and so forth and so on. But one of the things I've noticed in my work is that if you go to a Hispanic event, it's mainly Hispanics and you go to a black event, it's mainly African-American people. And um, even the same thing with women's events, you know, and I think we really have to make an effort to um, join and to be part of uh, other communities. That's mm-hmm. the only way we're going to learn. You have to engage with the other. And, uh, and whether you're talking about housing or whether you're talking about um, schools where you know we have some segregation in school systems, it, it really is time to reach out to the other and to join other organizations. Um, you know, one year I went to every church I could go to, you know, from the Muslims to the uh, to the um, meditation, to the Baptist church, so we could sing and hallelujah and all that, you know, so I could see how other cultures uh, worshiped. And, and that's an important thing. We have to reach out and learn about the other. Uh, and we're doing it like with food, for example, mm-hmm. and music. Music now is is uh, is very diverse if you watch uh, the, the Grammys and so forth. But we also need to do it personally so we can learn and we need to invite people to be part of us. And many times people say, oh, we invite Latinos and they don't come. Well, come to our events. Mm. You know, what? one of the book signings I'm having here in Denver where I live is at Su Teatro, the Latino theater. And I'm inviting people to come to have a, a Latino immersion experience. <laughs> you know, you can go to plays, you can music, you can connect. Um, and that's the first step. And then after that, of course, is the, the work of really building uh, multicultural organizations. And um, but it's going to happen. So we might as well get with the program. That's yes. The That's what now, leaders do <laughs> now. Right. So let's take a look at these or, results. We have about a third of people who have read some fiction to help fabulous, learn about the Latino fabulous. experience. Uh, uh, about a third have read some nonfiction. 62% are saying they've learned another way and 40% are saying they would like to learn more. And, you know, that's the perfect segue to the the last question that I have for you, Juana, um, what I hear you saying is that the way that we can learn more about Latino culture is to seek out opportunities. So as a member of a, uh, of a, uh, what I I lost the word there. Um, Majority group. The majority group. As a member of a majority group, it it is on me and others. I hate these labels, but we got to do it somehow. Right. It's it's on me and others to seek out those opportunities to be in relationship. Think about how many years I studied in, in, in Anglo-dominated schools, if you want to call it that, because our school systems are still based on, on dominant culture values. And so, you know, it would take a long time for somebody to catch up. <laughs> it would, it would. And the other cultures, but what a great opportunity. 
Yes, an opportunity. And the opportunity that you have for us is to become Latino by heart. And so I would love for you to share with us, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? How do we get there? And how does that help us as our world is becoming multicultural? Um, so t tell us about that. Well, first of all, Latinos are not a race. Uh, we're an ethnic group, much like the Jewish community. So you can be Jewish and be from Poland, or you could be a Sephardic Jew from Mexico, or you can be from Germany, you can be from Poland, you can be from Cleveland, you know, um, it's an ethnic group. And uh, because it's an ethnic group, we are united by our history, you know, because we that were colonized by the Spanish, by our language that came out of that. Uh, by a common spiritual tradition, which has integrated both indigenous and, and uh, Spanish uh, Catholicism. And also um, we are united by our values and our values such as generosity and hard work and sharing and inclusiveness. Inclusiveness is a huge Latino value. We even have this word called bienvenido, welcome. And I call it the bienvenido spirit that we welcome people to work with us. And so, um, so what happens when you have a culture, not a race, now you can't become African-American or American Indian, or, but you can become Latino because it's a culture. And uh, we invite people to participate in our culture. And it's a different culture. We're a people-centered culture. We're not a materialistic culture. People come first, relationships come first, family comes first, community comes first. Our contribution to others comes first. You're respected, not by how much money you have, or, you know, that you're respected by how much you contribute to others. You know, that's how I get my respect, because my community knows that I have spent my life helping to uplift and to inspire people. And so we invite people to join with us in our, in our cultural uh, bazaar, if you want to call it that, our multicultural bazaar. Um, you know, you can become Latino by corazón, by reaching out to Latinos and by learning about our values. Um, resourcefulness, by the way, is another value that we have. How did we get here through 500 years? Well, there's a saying, you can always put another cup of water in the soup. You know, you can stretch your resources. So Latinos are a very resourceful community that are always looking for new ways of doing things. And how can we, uh, how can we respect and honor the people that, that, that are in our community, especially our elders, and the promise of our youth. That is so powerful. Uh, and I love hearing about that um, and the chance that we each have to uh, learn and grow uh, together. By the way, you might become a really good dancer. <laughs> uh, I think that's impossible. Maybe with enough margaritas, I could become <laughs> a good dancer. Margaritas and a little bit of a salsa beat. Let me just tell you something about salsa. You know, salsa pa passed ketchup as America's favorite condiment in the 90s. So for the last 20 years, 30 years almost here, we have had salsa. And you know, ketchup is great, but it's pretty homogenized, right? It's just one thing, and I love it on my fries. Salsa Express sells 2,000 kinds of salsa. So salsa is a great metaphor for diversity because you can have all different kinds of salsa, but it's also a dance, and it's also a way of life. <laughs> to have salsa in your life is to enjoy what you do, to love your family, you know, to feel like you're making a contribution, to be on target with your purpose. And so, you know, Latinos are bringing salsa to America, but we want everybody to go ahead. Amazing. So I want to, before we move to questions, and uh, we would welcome you to put your questions into the chat. I do want to let you know a bit more about the book. I have seen some questions in the chat about how do I get the book? How do I pre-order the book? Uh, so The Power of Latino Leadership is launching next Tuesday, March 28th. You can pre-order it now on Amazon and other online retailers. Um, and we would also invite you at uh, as you've seen the passion and energy for this work to share the book on your social media channels. If you get a copy, we would uh, welcome your Amazon review. Another thing that you can do is invite Wanda to speak to your organization. And you can find out more about how to contact her by visiting her website, wandabordas.com and signing up for her newsletter so you can stay in touch with everything she has going on. I've been receiving her newsletter. It gives you a glimpse into all the ongoing learning and opportunities and contribution that she's making to the world. Uh, so thank you uh, for for being here with us today. And we would love to take your questions. Um, I'd love to ask them in the chat. Um, and so as I see your questions, I'd be happy to ask them. Um, and while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Juana, I'm curious about, um, you know, there are 10 principles of leadership in the book. You only shared about four with us. Would you maybe share a bonus principle with us? Well, the us? bonus I think is intergenerational leadership uh, because it's so important today. 
And I have to say that the young leaders I interviewed are really concerned about the future. And we know that. I mean, 68% of our youth have climate anxiety. You know, and I think, you know, some of my friends say they want to retire. And I go, no. <laughs> you know, you have such valuable, we have boomers on this call. We have such valuable knowledge. And I saw a question about how do you teach young people patience? And one of the only things I've learned is to say to them, look, you know, I, first of all, to acknowledge their skills, because boy, do they have skills that I don't have. And, uh, and also to say to them, look, you know, I want to prepare you to be the best you can be. You know, I, I have uh, my assistant is planning to go to law school. And I'm like, I'm training you to become a good lawyer by really helping you because they push a button and it's over. Whereas we know that to have excellence and quality, you have to have patience, you have to go over it. I tell them I write things seven times and they are like this, right? And I say to them, how good do you wanna be? You know, how much do you wanna stretch your talent? Um, and you've got all these skills, but I wanna help you get some perspective and I wanna help you uh, strive for excellence because I don't think, Young people have been told that you have to strive for excellence and you have to strive to use your talents the best you can. And so I think helping young people have purpose, but intergenerational leadership, as we've talked about, also includes, includes being an ally. And it also includes being work, uh, working in social change because young leaders call themselves change makers and they understand that everything's related. They, they understand that it's a system that has kept people oppressed, whether it's women or African-Americans or whether it's what's happening with our elder, elderly today. Young people understand that it's a system of institutionalized racism, if you wanna call it that, that has kept people from really advancing. So I think you know they have a lot to teach us and at the same time, we have to really roll up our sleeves and work side by side with them. Wonderful. So I am seeing a lot of questions. I will get to as many as I can. Um, but earlier in the call, uh, Maureen asked this question. Uh, they said, I'm passionate about the power of language and the ways it reflects our worldview and also creates our world. Uh, the Spanish language is highly gendered and patriarchal, must use Latino instead of Latina. What is being done to dismantle the patriarchy inherent in the Spanish language to foster greater inclusion of female and non-binary humans? Well, I know that especially young Latinos are using Latinx as a uh, non binary By the way, in my work with <clears throat> intergenerational leadership, that's one of the things that they say, that, um, that gender is on a spectrum and uh, that we have to accept that and that that's uh, you know, really part of their, their culture and part of the contribution they're making is to really look at gender roles. But when you look at the Spanish language, um, there's Latinx for young people. There's also Latin, which is L-A-T-I-N-E, which is what is being used in South America as a non-gender term and also to connect the hemisphere because <clears throat> you have to understand that the Latino phenomena goes across this entire hemisphere. And so Latin is being used. I, I also would like to invite people to look at the gender uh, terms, Latina, Latino, um, as, you know, at least we recognize the fact that there's two genders in the language, whereas the English language doesn't recognize that <clears throat> as much. Um, so it, it kind of depends on the individual. Again, we're living in an age where there's a lot of, you know, young people say just be you, which means they understand that everybody's different. Mm -hmm. And so Latinos do offer a broader spectrum, if you want to call it that, on, on gender and gender identity. <clears throat> Thank you for that. I know it's a tough question. Uh, so Ruben is wondering, what can we do to add this book into high schools, especially in Latino communities? This is so important that our youth have some guidance in this area. Great question, because that's absolutely true. Um, I wrote this book at the re at kind of the urging of um, of leaders, um, and they were mainly Anglo men. I do not think of diversity as color or race or culture or age. I think of it as consciousness. Do you really want to create a society where everybody's respected? Do you really want to extend that to people regardless of where they're from and their age and so forth? And so these white men encouraged me to write and to put down this information because this is the first book on how Latinos have led their people. And, and I think it's so important. I mean, identity is important. And young people are into identity. Who am I? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so when you look at identity, you need to know your history. I talk about Latino genesis, how we came to be through, through the 
through Spain and, and, and through the conquest. I talk about manifest destiny, which is something we need to look in, in the eye. You know, the fact that our country believed that they had, um, they were called by God to dominate other cultures. You know, we, we, need to, we need to understand this and how it happened. So young Latinos need to know about their culture, about the greatness of their leaders and about how we got to where we are. But more than that, I have a concept called Latino destino, the destiny of Latinos, which I believe is to help bring about the humanistic and multicultural society. And by humanistic, I mean a society that takes care of its people. Hmm. So what recommendations would you have for Ruben to get the book into high schools? Well, Ruben, I'm working as hard as I can, and I'd love to connect with you. Um, and so one of the things that I've done uh, is I've been working with a group called ALIS, which means uh, uh, wings. And it's a group to help uh, prepare Latino superintendents, principals to become superintendents. That's the kind of change we have to have in America because when you get a Latino superintendent, they're gonna understand that the majority of kids in, in their schools are now Latinos and that they don't have resources to help these young kids or young people connect with their ancestry, connect with their culture, connect with the leaders who have brought us to where we are and then have a vision for where we're going as a people and as a country. So I'm with you, I'm working it, help me. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so Steve Persanti, who I know is the editor of your book, is here on the call. And he was wondering if you would share with people about why you picked uh, this time to write the new edition of the book or why you decided to write a new edition. Yeah, well, you know, people don't know who I am, by the way. We never we never had got my backstory or my origin story. <laughs> well, I'm an immigrant. I'm an immigrant from Nicaragua people. I came here at three years old on a banana boat uh, crossing the Gulf of Mexico with, uh, I had eight brothers and sisters. And I am the powerful person that I am because of the immigrant experience and because of the hope, the faith, the stamina, the determination that my parents had to forge a better life for their children. You know, that's so important. And yet when I was growing up, there was no such thing as Latinos. See, remember, Latinos weren't even called a group till 1980. And, you know, by this time, I'm an adult. And, uh, and so I understood as I, um, as I finished college that I had lost part of my soul. And uh, I joined the Peace Corps. And part of that was John F. Kennedy. Again, we can inspire youth to do things. He inspired me. And I went to Chile and uh, I learned about my culture uh, I saw that everybody in Chile, this wonderful culture uh, and, and, and country were Latinos. So I knew it a very, or Hispanic, I knew at a very young age, it wasn't my culture that prevented us from being in leadership and, and from being in positions of, of influence and, and, so, and having equity. And so I came back to the United States, started working in my own community. So I actually have 50 years of working uh, it, and, and also with the dominant culture because I was at the Center for Creative Leadership and so forth. But I wrote the book now because of what's happened in the last 10 years. And that's why the word ahora is there. We are now seeing the Latino community as the fastest growing. We are now seeing that by the middle of the century, we'll have the critical mass to help Latinize America. And I want to tell you again, it's gonna be a really good time for everybody. We want everybody to come with us. And so, um, so this is an essential time. I say it's Latino time in America today. It's time for us to start moving forward and to bring our great gifts into the mainstream. Thank you. And, you know, we've got some amazing uh, comments in the chat. Um, and, you know, a few people saying, you know, despite the many positive contributions of our culture, Latino culture, that uh, people are still marginalized, um, you know, getting the younger generation to be patient with us as baby, baby boomers is difficult. Um, so I, I think that in the chat, what we're seeing, Juana, is, is people being inspired by your message, um, which is tremendous. Um, we want to let you know again how to get a hold of this book. It will be available in shipping from major retailers next week. So the book will be available everywhere uh, March 28th. And we would love for you to join this movement. Uh, Ruben mentioned in the chat, Juana, that he would like to start a YouTube channel to be able to get this message to others. So uh, for those of you who are, are wanting to get involved, we encourage you to stay connected to Juana through her newsletter, invite her to speak to your organization to bring this powerful message. And Juana, <clears throat> I believe that you were wanting to uh, send us out with a reading from your book and some inspiration as we wrap up this hour of learning together. Yes. 
So this is called Bienvenido, which means welcome, a model for an inclusive America. My family is a sundry variety of Latinos, like a delicious box of assorted chocolates. My seven brothers and sisters and I immigrated from Nicaragua, and those older than I speak with a Spanish accent. Our children were born and raised in the United States and have a more blended Latino experience. Many of them married into different cultural groups, so now we have Latinos by marriage. My brother-in-law, Carl, who is of German descent, and my niece's Lori's Anglo husband can both attest that if you hang around with Latinos long enough, the rhythm's going to get you. Then they are the wonderful amigos who have been part of our extended family for so long that they are now Latinos by affinity or corazón, heart. If you are not Latino by birth, this book is an invitation to do likewise to become part of the familia, to experience our dynamic culture and learn about the powerful ways Latinos have led their people. To tap your feet to the salsa beat and become a Latino by corazón. To reach out with and respect and anticipate people of all ages to join us in creating an inclusive America that heals the divisions that have separated us. powerful. Thank you.